Welcome to this pre-recording of a lecture on dealing with singular solutions of polynomial homotopies. Um, so this is still a preliminary report. Uh, not everything is uh, in preprint form. Um, it's also joint work with uh, Kailash uh, Vis Van Nathan. Um, and uh, this talk is scheduled to happen live uh, tomorrow. So it is a pre-recording, a preview of a topic which is outlined here. So I have three sections in this talk. So three points I want to make. Uh, first and foremost, what is the problem? And what are the tools that we are applying? So that's the introduction. Uh, the methods that I hope to show that they are effective are Richardson and Aitken extrapolation. So that is the second part of this talk. And in numerical analysis, dealing with singularities is essentially a reconditioning. Uh, so I will explain in the third part how we go from monomial homotopies to general problems. So but first comes first, so this introduction uh, should define the extrapolation and the homotopy uh, which are in the second and the third part of this talk. So what is the problem now? Uh, we are dealing with singular uh, solutions, uh, so that's actually the problem. And uh, we are encountering these singularities when we are studying uh, the solutions as defined by a polynomial homotopy. So in a polynomial homotopy, we have a family of polynomial systems that is governed by one parameter. Um, so we go from systems where we know the solution to systems where we do not know the solutions and we want to approximate one solution. So this mm, is a method that works extremely well but may break down at the end uh, when we have singular points. So what is a singular point? Uh, at that point, uh, when we evaluate the derivatives and set up the matrix of all partial derivatives, that matrix is not full rank. Newton's method also breaks down. Um, so we distinguish uh, two parts in this problem. So there is the location problem. Can we detect uh, when such singularity is nearby? And then we have the approximation problem. Um, so if we have a value for the continuation parameter for which the corresponding coordinates of the solution become singular, can we then approximate these coordinates uh, and if we still want that solution or not. Um, so uh, the, the, the importance to in distinguishing between these two problems is important because sometimes paths are, are diverging towards infinity. And infinity approximating that doesn't make any sense. Um, so we want to be able to give up on a path uh, with relatively little effort. So this is the verbose statement uh, of the problems in plain words. I will try to make it clear uh, with examples and formalism, how to deal with this problem. Oops. Um, here is a situational slide. Uh, so this picture was shown to me by a former student of mine, uh, Nathan Bliss. Uh, the Viviani curve is drawn in black, so it is this twisted eight figure. 
and it intersects itself like the 8. Um, and then you see all the curves, starting with the red curve uh, that passes through the top point. And uh, then you have the purple curve, uh, the green curve. And what you observe here is that as the Viviani curve intersects itself, then also these uh, power series expansions, they are starting to intersect. And the intersection point is originally quite far, but what is important actually is that it predicts the uh, location of the singularity. So this was, picture was shown to me five or six years ago. At that time, I did know not much about, um, or not as much as I know now, uh, but it kind of piqued my curiosity. And uh, one could dismiss this more as a freak example, uh, kind of a coincidence. You're not supposed to evaluate power series at one. Uh, but still, I'm, I was very intrigued uh, at the possibility of detecting a singularity from afar. Um, okay, I should not use the buttons here. Um, so, uh, what is our main uh, tool, our main theorem? Not our theorem, so it's the ratio theorem of Fabry which dates back not of the last century, but the century before that. So it's a classical result. Um, it states that if you have a series uh, development, and the series is well defined in the sense that you can consider ratios of uh, consecutive coefficients. So the coefficient should not be zero. So this is the assumption that we will work on in this entire talk. We will also assume essentially that series are given to us. So by some tools uh, that compute them. But the point is that uh, the ratio theorem of Fabry kind of uh, states that from the series you can detect a singularity even from very far away like in the previous picture. So there is the singular point and there is also the radius. Uh, so the theorem says a lot. So the magnitude of the singular point actually says how accurate your series are. So there is the rate, the, the range of convergence in which you can work with series. Now, this theorem is, uh, belongs to advanced complex analysis. Uh, the proof is complicated, but the connection with rational approximations, also called Bade approximations, is rather immediate, as I will explain on the next slide. So here, look at a power series truncated at order 5, so we forget about the error. So it's an order 5 series. So we have 5 coefficients in the terminology of uh, the previous slide, the n equals 3. So we consider 3 over 4, C3 over C4. So that's the bottom line. Uh, C3 of C4 will predict the location of the singularity, but you can also get at this when you construct a Padé approximation. So a Padé approximation, you first settle on the degrees of the numerator and the denominator, so it's a ratio of two polynomials, and the Padé approximant is constructed so it agrees with the power series for the first uh, terms. So here you see that one identifies the coefficients and you first solve for the coefficients of the 
term for the highest order term. And that actually will determine the location of the root of the denominator. So you see they should have said also that there is an important normalization. The rational approximations are, if you see them as the ratio of two polynomials, they are not unique. So to make them unique, we assume that the leading coefficient, that the least coefficients in the denominator is one. So this is a normalization. If you do this normalization, then there is the uniqueness. And the condition that the power series agree corresponds to saying that this coefficient corresponding to the term of C4 gives you the pole. The pole is the terminology for the root of the uh, denominator. So if you look at the rational approximation, then obviously it's not defined for values of the T parameter where the denominator becomes zero. So it's undefined. You could also see this as a solution going to infinity. So uh, something that is also known to practitioners is that solutions at infinity and singular solutions, they are quite equivalent. One is difficult, and uh, if you have a solution at infinity, it's also a singular solution. Okay, um, we will not be able to cover all cases of singularities. Uh, so here you see an example of a homotopy. So the homotopy is a family of uh, polynomials here, in this case, one variable. Uh, we have essentially a square root uh, that we have to take, but we take the square of a quartic, uh, so we have two exact branches. Um, so there is not a power series here, so the power series stops at order 3. So the coefficient with t to the power 3 is 0, and all consecutive terms are 0 as well. Despite that, it is a singularity. Um, so at t equals 1, the two paths coincide. So this is a situation that we do not cover, but I hope it is obvious that once you compute your series, you observe that they stop, and that means that actually you do have, in this case at least, you do have an exact representation for the solution paths. You merely have to evaluate. So the problem, the original problem of locating an approximation is actually solved here. Okay, so this is a preliminary report, but I will draw on previous results. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the work uh, joined with Nathan Bliss, uh, the picture on one of an earlier slide. Uh, so we have ex explored the application of linearization and Newton's method to compute uh, power series solutions. And then in the second reference here, we observe that already with eight terms in the power series, uh, we can compute uh, the, we can locate singularities close enough to avoid uh, bumping into singularities. So the middle reference here uh, gives an indication for the effectiveness, uh, for the practical usefulness of Taylor series uh, in numerical path tracking algorithms. What we shown in the third reference is uh, that the Richardson extrapolation is already quite effective in locating the closest singularity. So I will draw on the results in that third reference. 
And now, well, the new thing is about uh, the uh, Aitken extrapolation. And in the last year, I've gained a lot of insight also. Um, so there is the difference and the connection with uh, Cauchy integrals and complex analysis. Um, what this slide mainly does is making the distinction between Taylor series, which always start at a regular point, by default at zero, and Laurent series, where you allow for negative exponents, negative leading exponents of the series, which are also a tool to characterize and uh, singularities. But in that case, you are circulating around the singular solution. So here I give mainly the connection with the Fourier series, uh, a method to compute uh, series approximations. Uh, this is a cartoon to distinguish uh, both situations. So we work with Taylor series. And in any case, um, the step size is important, no matter what method that you are using. So that's the similarity between the two. Um, so in our work, I've been um, more appreciating the classical literature. Uh, so numerical analytic continuation appears in the 1966 paper by Henry Chi. Um, also the connection with the Fourier methods in uh, computing power series is explained there. Um, and the connection with the step size is in the paper by Fornberg. Um, it turns out that the question of what is the best uh, step size is actually depending on which terms in the Fourier series that you want. If you want uh, the leading terms, um, the lowest degree terms, then actually small step sizes matter most. Uh, but if you want uh, the last coefficients, then actually you would need to take uh, larger step sizes. Uh, so in the context of Fourier methods, you kind of have to try uh, working with multi-scales. Um, and there's also, by the way, the quaternion uh, Fourier uh, method and the quaternion step size, which I didn't mention here in this slide. There is the paper by Peter Wynn on the epsilon algorithm. Uh, it's an extrapolation, one of the uh, very famous extrapolation methods, which I will not discuss here, but I mention uh, the title, um, the connection also with rational approximations and power series expansions. The functions that we consider here are the solutions of polynomial homotopies, and they are analytic and well-defined with Taylor series. Uh, the two last references are books uh, on extrapolation methods, um, especially the last reference is very extensive. Um, it was a great help in uh, this uh, work. Okay, uh, I spent ample time on the first part, uh, the problem. So let us now look at extrapolation methods. Um, choosing the examples is important, uh, and I will restrict uh, first to very basic examples of uh, polynomial homoto of, of monomial homotopies. Um, so uh, this is the simplest non-trivial example I can come up with. Uh, so it is a square root of one minus t. So we are in the situation where at t equals zero, we know uh, the two solutions, one and negative one, so we will focus on one branch, and at t equal one, we have a double root. Um, so if we can't solve this problem, then what can we solve? Uh, so this is a bottom-up approach. Um, 
So we start to apply our extrapolation methods to the square root of 1 minus t. It also allows for the plain methods of calculus to do this. Um, to make it a little more interesting, instead of taking only the square root, so the square root is the case omega equals 2, we will also take higher order roots. So we take cube roots, quartic roots, and quintic roots. The geometry is interesting already. Uh, so we see at t equals 0, nothing much changes. Um, so in essence, uh, the computation of the Taylor series is not influenced by this. Um, so locally, you are still at a very safe distance from the singularity. But look at what happens at the singularity. You notice that uh, the curvature, so we actually hit the singularity as a, as a much deeper angle. So the singularity gets a lot worse at t equals 1. So this is kind of to indicate that if you start using methods close to 1, um, it will be extremely difficult. Uh, you, will, you may be still be able to do something in the case of the square root, but as the winding numbers increase, uh, you will get into trouble. Okay, um, here is another monomial homotopy uh, that's very useful to test for divergence. Uh, so monomial homotopies, one can solve them for any value of t, so you do actually not need path tracking homotopy, so you have a double check. Uh, analytically, you can compute the solutions. But here you see that when as x goes to 0, the y has to go to infinity because of the second equation. So we apply the logarithm. So we have the series of the logarithm and we do the composition of series. And actually, what I hope to indicate here is that the distinction of convergence and divergence can already be made uh, very quickly from the leading terms in the series. So these are fifth order uh, series, but actually what matters in the logarithm is that uh, the sign, uh, either with the, your, the logarithm you measure the magnitude, uh, and either you go up or you go down. Um, so evaluating at one, is something that you're not supposed to be doing, uh, but either you go to minus, so the, the numbers become very, very small, or the numbers become very large uh, when you have a positive or a negative sign. So it's a sign change. Uh, so can you also figure out the winding number from this? Well, yes, you can. Uh, observe on this class of examples what happens when you increase the omega, so the omega parameter um, manifests itself in the denominator. So geometrically we saw there was a very steep uh, change, but if you go over to logarithmic scale, everything becomes very clear. Um, and for this example with the monomial homotopy with an x and a y, the y goes to infinity, so what matters with the x is actually no longer relevant. And uh, going to zero and going to infinity is also something that you observe when you look at diverging paths. Uh, in order to still have a solution, some coordinates have to go to zero, other ones have to go to infinity. Okay, uh, Richardson extrapolation. So in this part here, I'm at the middle of the lecture. I'm kind of uh, summarizing the main results from our most recent paper. Starting with the lemma. Uh, so this lemma mathematically looks very trivial. Um, but numerically, it's critical that when you look at the coefficients of the Taylor series, if you see 
that they are increasing, then this actually means that you're in trouble. So in some sense, if you are having big difficulties computing your Taylor series, then this is already an indication that, hey, you do have a nearby singularity. If your coefficients decrease, uh, then actually you are in a good shape. Um, but that actually, with true nonlinear homotopies, this doesn't really happen that often. So actually what you want is you want that your coefficients remain of the same magnitude, if possible, constant. Um, constant, if they remain constant, uh, then you have convergence radius 1. Um, so in some sense, if you know what is the convergence radius, then it's just a simple coordinate transformation. So that's what I meant when I said that the lemma is actually in some sense, mathematically trivial. If you know that is the convergent, what the convergence radius is, then you just do this coordinate transformation. You just do this. Uh, so I try to avoid this uh, because this is actually critical. Can we do this? But now we are in the critical, uh, in the theoretical part. Um, so we are interested um, in examining how good this uh, Fabry ratio theorem actually is. Can you uh, say something with Taylor series uh, about something that is essentially quite far away? So here is the uh, main theoretical result uh, that we proved in the CASC 2022 paper. So it states that uh, after doing this coordinate transformation, and also numerically you can't really do anything unless the uh, coefficients are of constant magnitude, then actually one can show that the ratio, uh, the error, so the radius is 1, so also without loss of generality, we may assume that uh, for t equal 1, we now have our singularity. So this explains the 1 here. So the error is proportional to 1 over n. So the big O means that there is a constant. Um, um, in, that constant is it's important that it is constant, although it matters a lot if it's 1 million or 1 over 1 million. Now, uh, the good thing about this result is that if you want to avoid singularities, and we did extensive uh, computational experiments on millions of parts, then having eight terms of a series is sufficient to avoid a singularity to decide a safe step size. So in some sense, this confirms um, our computational experiments. But there's very bad news if you want to locate uh, the singularity. If you know it's at 1, then of course you're done. But before deciding whether it is 1 or not, um, so then uh, you are in trouble. And I make this picture here, so at the, uh, a logarithmic scale actually shows it very clearly. So here I'm omitting the big O term. I'm not saying that is representative for all situations, um, but what this theorem essentially says that with uh, eight terms, you do have three bits of accuracy in your nearest singularity. If you want 4 bits, well, you have to double to 16. And if you want 5 bits, you have to double again. And if you want 6 bits, uh, you have to double again. The point is that even if I take uh, Taylor series as a given, and that's actually in practical applications a big assumption, then it's going to be extremely costly to accurately uh, locate a singularity. So in some sense, this confirms uh, Taylor series are extremely inaccurate uh, when, except for very, very nearby situations. 
Okay, so uh, we would be done, except that we can now apply Richardson extrapolation. So, uh, what did we show? So, in some sense, it's therefore important to consider also the proofs of uh, propositions and theorems. I will not drag you through that proof. But actually, if you have a 1 over n order, it means that you can apply a Taylor series again. So you have now a series in the 1 over n. Now the idea of Richardson extrapolation is indeed to double, but then to make a weighted combination of the more accurate, so you have an approximation that is one bit more accurate. So you kind of make this weighted combination, and if you choose your weights, knowing the uh, error extrapolation, uh, knowing the expansion for the error, then you can obtain an approximation that is of one order more accurate. So, and there's not much effort that you, that you need to do here. So it's just, a, and here this is just what it is, it is a row reduction. Uh, in more general terms, you could see this as that Richardson extrapolation, if you apply it iteratively, we are solving a linear system, a structured linear system, that we can solve with a cost that is proportional to the extrapolation order. So very efficient. So here is the algorithm. Um, Richardson extrapolation is covered in all introductory numerical analysis texts, uh, rightly so, because of its uh, practical use. So based on the assumptions of convergence radius 1 with the Taylor series of the solutions of a polynomial homotopy, we can actually approximate the location of a singularity quite accurately. With 64 terms, before we had only 6 bits, now actually we can have 8 decimal places. This is again relative to the constant. Sometimes it's 6, sometimes it's more than 8. Okay, um, so now let's go to the newer part. Um, so why not do Aitken extrapolation? Uh, what I want to get at in long term is to understand better the connection with Padé approximants. Uh, the connection is obvious, uh, but how to take advantage of this uh, is another matter. So Aitken extrapolation uh, is another tool. Uh, so Richardson extrapolation typically eliminates the errors when you want to compute the limit of a sequence. Uh, Aitken is a sequence transformation. So you have a sequence and you build another sequence. So it's another way of looking at it. Uh, if you are running Newton's method, it is uh, very um, natural to do it. Um, so Aitken extrapolation assumes a geometric convergence. So if you make this con assumption, um, so you have the limit of your sequence, uh, which exactly you don't really know, but assume that you know it, call it z, then the ratio between two consecutive errors uh, you should have convergence, and it should be uh, geometric. Um, so it should be a constant, uh, less than 1. So I will not drag you through the um, derivation of the formula, but if you sit down and you do some algebraic manipulations, then you can show that based on this assumption, by eliminating this convergence ratio r, you actually get to this sequence uh, transformation. 
also this uh, formula is covered in uh, most good introductory texts in numerical analysis. And just as with Richardson extrapolation, you apply this formally uh, repeatedly. So what is our problem again? So we have uh, our uh, Itken, uh, we have our series. So in our monomial homotopy, here I did this with SymPy uh, to compute the Taylor series approximations. And we have two, uh, two problems actually. Uh, we have, we can apply this to the series sum if you want to know the coordinate of the uh, single solution, which is zero in this case here. And we have the ratio, the location problem. So here we have the location problem computation of R, and the approximation problem, computation of S. So uh, when I first tried this, and uh, this is now a while ago before we backtracked to Richardson, it didn't work. Um, so, uh, but I redid it uh, with exact rational arithmetic. Um, so I tried it first with uh, double precision arithmetic and it gave not so good results. So that is still an issue here with extrapolation methods. The formulas themselves may lead to numerical instabilities. And I will get to that. Um, so in the construction of this talk, this is a bottom-up approach. Um, we first do our experiments and if they work, we try to figure out or justify why they worked. Um, so uh, this is a computational approach. Uh, we trust that we can do computations very well. So what do we see? Uh, it can is for the location problem. It doesn't really depend on the winding number. Uh, so you get your winding number uh, if it's five. Well, you can see some differences, some fluctuations, but in numerical analysis, we read the numbers from right to left. So we have 10 to the power minus 11 as the accurate. Uh, so already for order 64, this is actually better than Richardson extrapolation. On the other hand, we notice the winding number when it gets to the coordinates. Uh, so we see that for high winding numbers, the Aitken extrapolation is not so accurate anymore. We only get about three decimal places uh, of zero. is kind of strange to say, but we get about, uh, it's the absolute error that increases to three decimal places. Okay, so we came in as cowboys uh, shooting first and now asking questions later. Uh, so the important problem, of course, is why is this working? Uh, were we just uh, lucky? Okay, um, here is our setup. So we assume that we have a nice Taylor series. None of the terms, none of the coefficients equal zero. And uh, the convergence is geometric. So for this problem, let us look what is the convergence uh, ratio using the results uh, that we use to justify Richardson extrapolation. So in mathematics, we always try to reduce it to the previous case. Well, we showed that we have this extrapolation formula that made Richardson work. And uh, we can derive an expression for the convergence ratio. So this, convert, this confirms that we do have convergence, uh, but it also confirms uh, what we observed earlier, that the convergence rate was still less than one. It is actually getting very close to one. So in, in, in some sense, this is not good. Um, it is converging, uh, but the convergence rate is actually getting very, very close to one. And here is another problem. Uh, the convergence radius depends on n. 
So and that is actually not what makes Aitken work. Uh, we want the constant uh, convergence radius. So this is actually not really good news here at all. But then look at uh, the ratio for two consecutive terms. So we have derived on the previous slide that the ratio depends on n. So it gets further and further away. So um, like with the two log plot, uh, to get one bit more of accuracy, we need to do twice the amount of work. Now the point of this slide is that if you have a local state of mind, and this is also how Aitken works, you don't really compute, like with Richardson, the uh, ratio with of the, the, the combination of terms that are too far apart. You actually combine, uh, you make something from two consecutive terms. And the point that I want to show in this uh, slide here is that if you look at the ratio between two consecutive terms, then you will actually see that they're almost identical. So the order differs with 1 over n squared. So th there is a difference, but actually when you think of order 1 over n, it's about the same of constant. So locally, if you work with still a limited accuracy, also then the 1 over n square is actually seen as zero. Bit same as if you reason in uh, numerical analysis about precision. If you have 10 to the power minus 8, then 10 to the power minus 16 is closed to zero. Can be ignored. Okay, so this is a justification why it can works uh, for the location problem. Uh, for the sum, one can do a very similar uh, reasoning. So this is why it, uh, in my opinion, why it is converging. So you see here that uh, we have a sequence that is decreasing. So here the assumption is that we are approximating zero, and that's a big assumption actually, uh, in, in, in theoretical papers. Uh, one often sees, well, assume we are computing a single solution, well, assume without loss of generality that the singularity is at zero. Uh, that's an assumption that one can make, for sure, but it is a big assumption. I will address this assumption. But also here, one can make a similar argument. I did not make that argument. Um, so this is where the preliminary part of this presentation uh, reflects to. Okay, uh, this summarizes the second part of my talk. Uh, so monomial homotopies we can do. So it gives us a laboratory settings uh, going to the sciences. We have a very isolated uh, setup where we can live happily within the assumptions and the confines of the definitions. Now monomial homotopies are not practically important, um, so they are useless, except for insight. And that's, of course, then contradicting the previous use, uselessness statement. Uh, we want insight. In numerical analysis, we recondition when we deal with singularities. Uh, so I will hope to demonstrate in this third part that locally, locally we can fix a homotopy. Globally, that's a whole different part. But at the local level, we can reduce everything to the monomial situation. Okay, in some sense, this uh, part uh, reboots a little bit. Uh, so what are we doing? We are tracking a path. Uh, the continuation parameter is real, goes from zero to wherever we want to go, typically to one. We have two situations. Um, the nearest singularity has a non-zero imaginary part. So this, these plots are uh, in complex plane. And in that case, well, knowing approximately, and if we have a couple of bits 
uh, of the uh, location that will suffice to select our step size. So here we're going in the first cartoon, we're going past a singularity. Now uh, we are now faced with the opposite problem. We cannot go past, because, well, we could go past if we would be using complex uh, values for the parameter. And then indeed we can always reduce to the first case. So if you are, but we want to find uh, a solution with t equals zero. So we notice that, hey, the nearest singularity is at one. And what a path tracker then will do, it will uh, gradually decrease uh, the step size and we will essentially never get to one. Unless uh, we recondition so we actually should never get at one because with Taylor series, we cannot handle that case. Instead, uh, we reduce to the case where with a monomial homotopy, there was no singularity in between t equal zero and t equal one. Well, we can handle that case. If we are not in a monomial homotopy case, then there is a singularity. And uh, I can define the last poll uh, with words, but first let me uh, explain the picture. So this is a picture that should be read from left to right. At the left situation, the row is still important in setting the step size. So this is the case where we move past row. Then there is a critical situation where we are at the same distance of rho then to one. So that is the T star. So this is the location where when we get past T star, we are at the situation of a monomial homotopy, where there is no singularity anymore between T star or T naught and one. So the last pole is the complex value for t with a non-zero imaginary part and with the real part that is closest to one from the left. So that's the algebraic definition in words of the last pole. Now at t equals t star, or again approximately, preferably past uh, t star, we can recondition the homotopy. So we can fix the homotopy in the sense that this is a situation before and after. At the left, we have in the original coordinates, when we are with t naught equal t star, at equal distance or approximately. And we have already noticed essentially, so we do this when we notice that the next pole is actually one. So at that point in time, we recondition the homotopy. And the reconditioning actually setting at zero happens all the time. Henry Shi calls it the rearranging of the coefficients in the power series. So we always re reshuffle our coefficients so that we always start at zero. But then we scale. Um, so the, the, the step size is actually two-dimensional. Uh, I should have pointed this out as well, is that the step size, we have a step size in T, in the T space, but then we also have the scaling stage. So we can, instead of having the T all the way going from zero to one, so now we actually go from T star to one. We stretch that out. So there is kind of, uh, we have one parameter that governs uh, the transition of all the coefficients of all the monomials. Now what we are doing is that we are damping that transition. Instead of going from zero to one all the time, uh, we actually go from zero to something that is fairly small. So this recentering and scaling 
brings us back to the situation of the monomial case studies. Um, so this is the um, recentering and the scaling, also with the shift. Uh, notice that we know that we are approximating a singularity, but that singularity may be at infinity. And at infinity, we don't want to approximate anything. So we have to go over to logarithmic scale. Um, so, and you can always shift so that, uh, shift your coordinates so that you are at one. And then actually the logarithmic uh, series applies. If you don't want to do this, if you say I have a non-zero number, so that's that's actually important. Uh, the number should not be zero. So just in case that you happen to be at a number that was too close to zero, that may happen, uh, then actually you better would kind of blow up uh, your current coordinate to be one of or larger to one. But most likely what you will have already is that your numbers will start to get very large with a diverging part. Now you can always say I'm not interested in solutions with coordinates outside the box or so just truncate that. But I'm assuming that if you solve a polynomial system you may be interested in making this distinction between a solution with very large coordinates and a solution that truly lies at infinity. So that's the point why we make also the shift. And for numerical stability, we want uh, numbers to be around one. Okay, uh, so this is now the most speculative uh, slide of this whole preliminary report. Uh, it kind of brings everything together. Uh, so the point is that we want to do this when we have relatively few terms in the Taylor series, because if the convergence radius is large, numerically these coefficients blow up on us. So we want to, when we do this reconditioning, assuming now that our solution is not diverging, then uh, we will do this reconditioning in kind of a staggered way. Uh, so uh, staggered means for increasing orders of the series and it will also be done iteratively. So in some sense we want one as the radius. So we can kind of adaptively uh, select uh, the ratio, the, the ratio which will also be the scaling ratio. Just like with extrapolation uh, we may temporarily run into larger coefficients. Uh, so computing that scaling coefficient should be done with care and, uh, and this value should be, and also the transformations may have to happen uh, with the double-double uh, precision. So that is a local fix of the homotopy. Okay, uh, so the last uh, slide um, has the kind of very trivial type using partial derivatives. I should use this to indicate that we are approximating zero. Um, we are not approximating zero as the values of the coordinates, but we are approximating something different. Uh, so we are approximating singularities and it's also a zero finding problem. So we can check the proximity to our single solution, not by now looking like in the monomial homotopies, how close we are to zero, because we don't know the exact location of the singularity, but we can see what the uh, Jacobian matrix looks like. Um, so we evaluate the derivatives, algorithmic differentiation, uh, preferably, perhaps, and then we compute a non-trivial combination of the columns of the matrix of all partial derivatives. With the QR decomposition, we will find a vector in the kernel that will make a zero vector. 
And on that computation, we can, we do this, we can also extrapolate on that extrapolate with the zero sums. So when we apply the Aitken extrapolation to the um, to the um, sums of the series, uh, before we looked at the magnitude, it had to be zero, now actually we look at the columns, at the combination that we make. So this is also the generalization of the monomial homotopy case, uh, locally. All right, um, before I terminate, I will give two benchmark examples, two illustrative examples, I would say. They probably have also lost their uh, stature as real hard problems. Uh, so here is a first example example by Oyika uh, used to introduce deflation and actually for those who are knowledgeable with the literature with this uh, project I attempt to replace deflation entirely because deflation does not scale for uh, higher uh, dimensions. Uh, you see uh, what can be done here with Richardson extrapolation with 64 terms after reconditioning uh, using uh, ad hoc code, uh, so PHC pi, uh, sim pi, and pmat. Uh, we can get the singularity with 64 terms down to 10 to the power minus 6. So this is an illustration of the practical constant in the big O notation. So we get an order of 1 over n to the order of the extrapolation. So it could be 10 to the power minus 8 if your constant is 1. Here the constant is of the order 10 to the power 2. Um, I also want to point out at, uh, where is the location of the last pole. Uh, so the location of the last pole uh, is important here. So that's the new thing. Uh, should point out. So this is at that stage you can detect your singularity. You can detect the triple root. A larger example shows that, uh, so this is an example that was solved 20 years ago. Uh, so it's an example with nine uh, equations, nine variables. Uh, that's important. Uh, the multiplicity is 4. Uh, there are several roots. So this is a, an example that not only has two roots, like in the previous example, but where you have uh, tens of thousands of roots. There are also positive dimensional components. So that makes that uh, the last pole in the um, homotopy that I used here, the cheater homotopy for this example, uh, the, the, that is actually very close already. So in that sense that homotopy is extremely, is still well conditioned, but if you recondition it and with 32 terms, then actually the convergence radius becomes very obvious. Uh, obvious because in double precision we are um, used uh, to be very happy already with eight decimal places in the presence of a singularity. So what this states that you can locate the singularity still from a safe distance, so we're still at a regular point. The reconditioning was successful and um, computing those power series with Newton here, there was a nice quadratic convergence and we get uh, close to the singularity. Okay, so this uh, concludes in the last two minutes in this one hour uh, presentation. Um, we assumed in this talk that we could compute Taylor series. Um, so that's not a trivial assumption, but on the illustrative examples, it just worked, everything went fine. Taylor series are a much better tool than singular value decomposition. Uh, singular value decomposition will detect singularities, but they will also give you a false alarm if the problem is ill-conditioned. So it will be very difficult to make that distinction. And as far as uh, problems go, the larger and larger uh, the condition numbers grow. And it's very difficult 
to make uh, a good decision based on singular value decompositions. Reconditioning is necessarily, uh, and this has to be done in a staggered way gradually. So this is still the hard part now, the rewriting of a problem. Uh, we can decide using the composition of series, using the logarithm, to decide if a series diverges or not. Both Richardson and Aitken extrapolation are effective. Um, so this is a preliminary report. We are still studying uh, in an effort to make the connection better with Padé approximations what happens when we apply the epsilon algorithm. Uh, so the other uh, topic is that um, if you actually know the winding number, uh, can you improve uh, the Aitken uh, extrapolation? Or surely can you approximate the coordinates of the singular solutions better? Uh, my intuition is yes, uh, but it's only yes when you really have done it and when you justify this. So on past one hour, past the budget of time, I will stop the recording now. Uh, so thank you for your interest in this work.